OK, so we just talked about primary minerals and the weathering of primary minerals. And that potassium comes from primary minerals in most soils, unless soils are really, really weathered or they have parent material that just simply didn't contain a lot of pit, a lot of primary minerals that contain potassium. When those primary minerals, though, when they do weather and they release potassium, where does that potassium end up? That potassium ends up first in the interlayer of two to one type clays. That potassium is fixed in the interlayer. And so this picture in front of you illustrates that. We have a mica that may contain potassium. And you don't see potassium in this illustration, but potassium is actually part of the mineral structure itself. When this weathers and two to one type clays start to form like illites, or it could be montmorillonite, it could be illite, it might be vermiculite. Um, when micas weather, of course they have no CEC, they're broken down and two to one type clays form and potassium starts en ending up in the interlayer. All right, so in between the layers, potassium starts moving into the interlayer and is locked up in the interlayer. And as weathering continues, the interlayer starts to expand more and more, and eventually it's fully expanded. And potassium is locked up in the interlayer. All right, and so when we see differences in the amount of potassium that's locked up in the interlayer of clays, the two to one type clay specifically, there's a difference in the cation exchange capacity of these types of clays simply due to weathering over time of minerals that become two to one type clays. The two to one type clays that have relatively low CEC, these are illites. They have low CECs because they, they're not fully expanded or they cannot fully expand. And so potassium can move into the interlayer, but it can't fully move into the interlayer because these types of clays don't have a great deal of shrink swell. And the illustration is here simply to show you that there's not a lot of shrink swell, say, in where my cursor is. When you have soils that contain vermiculite, lots of CEC, cation exchange capacity, that's because the interlayer or the expansion and contraction can occur to a great extent in these types of clays. And when expansion and contraction occurs, there are certain cations or ions that can move into the interlayer. And not every cation can move into the interlayer, but potassium definitely moves into the interlayer. And we probably, if I didn't mention this to you in the nitrogen unit, I should have, that ammonium plus one can move in the interlayer as well. Of course, water moves into the interlayer as well. But potassium in this case moves into the interlayer. And when potassium is in the interlayer, it's not available. It's 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 slowly available, and it's slowly available because the potassium in the interlayer. There's a lot of potassium in the interlayer, and the only potassium that's really slowly available is the potassium that may be at the very edge of the interlayer. So I think about this with respect to the types of clays that we have. All right. And so here's two pictures, smectite on the left and kaolinite on the right. Now we've talked about these before, and I think I've showed this picture to you before. Kaolinites are one-to-one -one type clays. They stack nice and neat. They have no expansion or contraction. Their CEC is very, very low, unlike smectite that looks sort of amorphous, right? And so there is a lot of surface area. Smectite is a two-to-one type clay. And because of hydration or the shrinking and swelling of this clay, it looks like this. It looks somewhat amorphous because it shrinks and swells. And unlike kaolinite, which doesn't shrink and swell, and it looks nice and neat. Smectite does not look nice and neat. So this is non-exchangeable. This description is non-exchangeable. And this description of non-exchangeable potassium occurs in clays that are two to one type clays like smectites that you see in the bottom left hand corner, left side of the left hand corner picture, unlike kaolinites. So I want to talk about this with respect to the types of clays that we find in Ohio. So it took a little bit of digging, but I found this paper 
Potassium Relationships of Three Ohio Soils, published in 1979. Oh my gosh. And regardless, this still tells a very good story and the story would be identical today as it was in 1979. The table, what this table shows you are the relative amounts of the types of clays in the AP horizon or the plow layer, the, the top 15 to 20 centimeters roughly of soil. And the title of table two says that these are the relative amounts of AP horizon clay minerals with less than two micron particle size. Two micron is the size fraction. That's the greatest size fraction for clays. Everything less than two microns is a clay. So in this paper, there were three soils that the scientists looked at, um, Mudd and McLean, and a soil from near Toledo called Hoytville, a soil near Dayton called Brookston, and a soil near Worcester called Worcester. And if you look at the table, what this table shows you is pluses for different types of clays. And if you look at this table, we have lots of pluses for these three types of soils for our, this clay, which is illite. Um, we have a couple pluses for, for vermiculite, and we have quite a bit of pluses for montmorillonite. I can't remember what interstratified means. Maybe you couldn't separate the types of clays. Here's kaolinite, very little kaolinite in our soils, and then we won't worry about the last two. But illite, we have a lot of illite, and the pluses correspond to the concentrations of these types of clays or the percentages of these types of clays, not concentrations. So if you have four pluses, you have greater than 40% of the clays are illites. Three pluses, 15 to 40% of the clays are illites, Brookston and Worcester. And then the list goes on and on. And so this tells you something about the types of clays that are present across the state in general, right? We tend to have quite a bit of two to one type clays that are these three right here, illites, vermiculites, montmorillonites. And we actually have some kaolinites in our soils. So the previous slide showed you data from the AP horizon. This is another table from that same publication from 1979 and the same types of soils, but now with depth. And what I did was I highlighted the exchangeable and basically the not well the exchangeable and non exchangeable potassium in these soils the, so the soils that you saw on the previous slide just gave you relative percentages of the types of clays present this table on the other hand shows you the amount of exchangeable potassium so this is potassium on the exchange sites in the ap horizon in the hoytville near toledo or the amount of exchangeable potassium in the brookston soil series near dayton or the exchangeable potassium in the Worcester soil series near Worcester. And the important thing to note is that in the AP horizon, the exchangeable is always less than the non-exchangeable. And there's a reason for this. And the reason ties back to the previous slide and the schematic of weathering of primary minerals into two to one type clays with the interlayers. So what you find is that this non-exchangeable amount is the potassium that's in the interlayer, and it's always greater than what's on the exchange sites, always. And that's because the exchange sites are what feeds the plant, right? This feeds diffusion reactions for diff uh, diffusing potassium to the plant root. And the non-exchangeable slowly releases potassium to the exchangeable phase. And in fact, if you looked at these soils with depth, the exchangeable versus non-exchangeable, the non-exchangeable is always greater than the exchangeable. And that's important to note because of the two to one type clays that we have in our soils in Ohio. And at the very bottom of the slide, sorry, I'm looking over another screen here. The CEC of these three soils is 25, almost 27, and 13 and a half, respectively. And so the CEC tells you something about hmm, soil texture, and it tells you something about exchangeable, uh, exchangeable cations within a soil. How many cat, um, cations can these soils hold? And if you note this, um, and you look at exchangeable potassium, 
you know, you can start putting this puzzle together as to, OK, lower CEC soils contain lower amounts of exchangeable potassium in general. Greater CEC soils contain greater exchangeable potassium in general. And if that doesn't follow the trend, then it might be based on in terms of the data that you see, for example, like the Brookstone or Brookston soil series, maybe whatever was planted here during that given year or subsequent cropping rotations affected potassium on the exchange sites or that the amount of clays or the types of clays that are present in the Brookston are different than the Hoytsville. And you could go back to the previous slide if you'd like to, and in fact, maybe we should, um, went the wrong way. Okay, the Hoytsville has a lot of illite, and the Brookston doesn't have as much, and maybe it has 15% illite, and the Hoytsville has 40% illite or greater. And so this tells you a little bit more about this table here. So the Hoytville has more illite, so more two to one, so greater non-exchangeable and probably greater exchangeable than the Brookston. The puzzle, this is the puzzle that I'm teaching you in this class this year.